the organizers of this Congress. Asuncion Vila and me, we are very pleased to be here because we know, we, uh, we meet for the first time uh, Gilles Roboda in the late 70s and he followed us until the end of the world. And uh, the other reason uh, uh, is uh, because we, I am going to present you the results and some uh, conclusions of 38 years of uh, research in ethnoarchaeology. Uh, my other two colleagues, uh, I hope they are they are awake and attending us from Chile and from the border of uh, the, uh, the Canadian border. So that's the, the title, and let's go. I, I, I apologize for my dialect, my Catalan dialect. Yes, uh, we can. I guess we are all interested to know how were prehistoric societies, how did they change and why. But we don't have yet arguments to know if this image is better than this other one, or if this one reflects better the Paleolithic than this other one. Until the late uh, 70s, Western prehistoric archaeology used analogies taken directly from corpus of cultural historic oriented ethnographic sources that resulted in a conceptual insufficiency in existing explanations for many years and the source of lots of speculations. But uh, since then, the direction of data publishing has changed and the primary focus is now on ecology, technology, technology or paleogenetics. There is a sense of the impossibility of applying a rigorous archaeological approach to know social relationships. We need the theory because uh, there are serious indications of inadaptations and economic irrational processes that the adaptionist explanation of cultural materialism could not explain. On the other hand, ethnographic and uh, ethological analysis demonstrate a huge variability of possibilities in organizations. Anyway, uh, there are some common universal traits in modern hunter-gatherer societies. In sum, we can conclude that social organization is not imminent and there is a link between the organization of production and reproduction. And even more, we have to accept that the main social structure of extant hunter, fisher, and gatherer societies is a product of their own history, a long history, and we must explain how did these features emerge. Therefore, we need theory and an instrumental methodology to explain the origin of these features. We need it because we are aware that uh, what characterizes societies are the strategies for the organization of reproduction and for the production of subsistence. We must know what had been the dialectics between the production of goods, subsistence and implements, the production of people and the social reproduction, that is the ideological structure. Our theory sustains that Paleomesolithic societies were not in a natural uh, balance with the resources offered by the environment. Later, they had to be constantly adjusting the exploitation of the limited resources and that the technology allowed to access. And they do that through a controlled social reproduction. Thus, we argue that the specific character of hunter-gatherer mode of production is a contradictory relationship between the material conditions of the production, of the processes of production, and of reproduction. Uh, we state that uh, labor represents the means through which social relations and social behavior, including reproductive norms, are easily controlled. 
The difference in production activities according to sex makes it also possible to set an interdependence between the two sexes, assuring reproduction and continuity, and at the same time to relativize the value of the product obtained and by extension the value assigned to the people that produced these values. Those norms allow the control of reproductive relationships. In our theory, reproduction is the dominant variable in modern frontier gathering and its regulation is the essential element and that required over time the major investment of social effort. That is our theory, but we need uh, archaeological methodology to verify when and how did this feature arose. Ethnoarchaeology can be used to contrast ethnographic sources with the archaeology of synchronous sites of the same society. Our approach to ethnoarchaeology, which we have ca called experimental ethnoarchaeology, is intended as a tool for refining methods and establishing effective archaeological methodologies to develop social approaches to society from archaeology. This could assist in developing and refining the necessary methodology to approach the social organization of uh, the prehistoric societies. So, from the 1950-85 and spanning over two decades, we developed a series of projects of research in museums and on the field, mainly in Tierra del Fuego. We obtained we, uh, lots of data and we did produce a substantial body of publications and data that are contained in a whole uh, repository. Uh, the first step uh, was uh, the critical analysis of all written and photographic ethnographic sources from the 17th century to the beginning of the 20th century for three groups uh, that coexisted in Tierra del Fuego. We also analyzed all the objects in ethnographic museums from an archaeological perspective. We conclude that there was a social inequality between men and women among Fuegian people. The social control of reproduction through social norms was the central point for continuity. We also state that inequality is materialized and be, we can be quantified through the analysis of the objects and through the calculation of the effort invested by men and women in subsistence and reproduction. This is a scheme that we have already developed and explained in publications. The second step uh, was the field archaeology. We excavated uh, representative sites of all social activities we have extensively excavated Yammer settlements in different ecological locations along the Beagle Channel. We have also excavated uh, a settlement site in the inland on the north of the island. The spatial connections found in the occupation units indicate that there were recurring spatial patterns in the general organization of activities and distribution of consumed wealth. The repeated use of space by various agents reflects a deliberate strategy which in turn upholds social norms and ensures social order. We have also excavated and studied ceremonial places of Yamana people documented by ethnographic description and pictures. We also did excavate a ritual site of the Selman group in the north of the island. We could conclude that the ceremonial character is reflected by the architectural size and location of the structure compared to the regular occupation and also by a different treatment of the residues and a special consumption of vegetables elements that leave no other trace than phytoliths, charcoals and a particular chemical signal. 
in the sediment. We also worked for the sites and we conclude that there was a conservatism and a long-lasting practice and no significant diachronic differences in burial practices from the first archaeological documented moments. But there was a highly diversity and temporary accommodation to the environment and even to seasonality or to the circumstances of that. We did morphometric, paleogenetic and dietary analysis of the human remains located in American and European museums. We conclude that the body or, or skeleton, like any instrument, is the most direct evidence of its wear and tear and of the sexual division of tasks carried out by people. Entesopathies and paleopathologies, as well as dietary analysis, show differences between both sexes, which is supported by the function of the objects deposited uh, in the graves. The main conclusion of Tierra del Fuego is that the study of funerary practices and osteological evidence must be related to the spatial organization of production and consumption of both sexes in sediments and connected with the transmission and persistence of norms through ceremonial sites and items, thus providing a deeper understanding of the development of social norms and inequality. Uh, additionally, uh, we also stated that there was no clear border but a fluidity between groups that spoke different languages and the ethnography classified as different. That coincides also with the studies of ethnographic material in museums and also fits with the results of the paleogenetic analysis. Given the good results in Tierra del Fuego in 2008, we decided to analyze the, and contrast the development of coastal societies in the northwest coast of America with that of Tierra del Fuego. They are considered examples of the opposite extremes of undergathered social organization. Both are based on strategies of exploitation of littoral resources. It was necessary to explain why the processes of social development at the geographical extremes of the American Pacific coast, despite having similar starting conditions and apparent environmental and resource uh, similarities, resulted at the end in a very opposite social organization. We conclude that after a similar purpose and some correspondences between environmental crises and changes in the same direction on both extremes, the explanation of the final divergence lies probably in that in Tierra del Fuego, people, on a moment of crisis by overexploitation, did manage the reproduction and maintained the equilibrium of the system more effectively than in the Northwest Coast. Thus, historical trajectories in both zones were the result of a different management of reproduction through two, through two divergent historical processes, rather than a mechanical result of different environmental impositions or alternative resource management. These projects are underway and field work continues. They focus in the inner sea of Last Hope Zone, in, uh, habited by Kawashka people, on specific task sites like canoe yards and meeting places of people of different groups. We have uh, published some papers since then. New research also are continuing in the Norwegian coast to compare and evaluate the role of watercraft in the social and organizational strategies of seafaring communities in the Norwegian coast of North America and the Fuego Patagonia coast of South America. The last thing we have uh, done 
to reinforce the conclusions about the impact of social norms that affect the reproduction is uh, another experimental approach that uh, was now at hand, the use of arti artificial intelligence. The ultimate goal of this project was to see which social norms are crucial in regulating reproduction. We replicate the structure of the social norms relating to the reproductive behavior of five particular ethnographic societies. The simulation in the different groups have shown so far that it is possible to control the population growth used by a set of a combined social norm structure that regulate the reproductive relationships. In short, that the demographic development of hunter-gatherer societies is not constrained by natural factors, but mainly by socio-economical factors and social norms. The most important conclusions are that in developed hunter fisher gatherer regulation of social reproduction is the main driving force for continuity and change. Since there are not natural but social relationships, we have to know when and how did those social relationships emerge. But uh, can we include the study of social norms in the archaeological agenda, really? Or long ethno-archaeological experiment shows that the answer is yes, yes, we can. That archaeology can indeed approach the question of social organization. It is possible to recognize social inequality, but if and only if the methodology is reconsidered, reoriented to answer that new questions. It is crucial for developing a more comprehensive and dialectic oriented archaeology to provide explanations of social processes and their dynamics. There is a huge study opportunity in locations like the Moravian Upper Paleolithic where documented associations of sediments, burial and ceremonial items does exist. Thank you very much.